I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid. The world has a hundred questions I can play with. So I'll open my arms and eyes and wonder every day till the day I die. No one really knows why. Okay, I am about to wrap things up because no one wants to hear from me, but I would like to introduce our two guests tonight. Now, Dr. Robert Sapolsky, as we were saying, has home team advantage. I was just telling him before we started talking that I have heard people gushing. He is so beloved by this community in San Francisco, and I don't know how many scientists can claim that. Um, <laughs> he is an American neuroendocrinologist and author, currently a professor of biology and neurology and neurological sciences at Stanford University. Um, in addition, intriguingly, he's a research associate at the National Museum of Kenya and the author of many books, including Behave, <laughs> most recently. And he is going to be here in conversation with the visiting team, no less exciting, and <laughs> Dr. David Sloan Wilson is a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University. He applies evolutionary theory to all aspects of humanity in addition to the rest of life, both in his own research and as director of EVOS, a unique campus-wide evolutionary studies program that recently received NSF funding to expand into a nationwide consortium. Please join me in welcoming David Sloan Wilson and Robert Sapolsky. <laughs> Get out of the way. <laughs> well, we're supposed to do some kind of bromance then, Vera. Then. Let's, let's just act natural here. It's, <laughs> this is perfectly the norm. Um, well, I guess as the interviewer, I should start off. Let me let me start off by asking, how many people in here are currently or have ever been or even know a scientist? <laughs> okay, so one of the things that you may have picked up on either doing it or being in close proximity to is your average scientist spends an incredible amount of time working on some incredibly obscure question in just magnificent and, and eventually sort of festering solitude <laughs> and will occasionally come up with some factoid and the most common response to it is just yawning disinterest or if you're really lucky somebody in some Eastern European university is intent on showing you were wrong or if it really works out well, you've now contributed a factoid to the universe. Um, and within that framework, if you are a really good scientist, you manage to generate a whole bunch of those factoids and they comprise something interesting or solve some puzzle or inspire other people to do work. So that's one version of being a really good scientist. And David has certainly generated lots of factoids. The more fundamental way in which you can be an amazing scientist is one that David fits even better, which is to fundamentally change the way people think about something. And not with factoids, but with often lone voice in the wilderness insisting that people's conception of something that is very important is totally wrong and sticks with it long enough to be vindicated. And this is, I think, a fair summary of what the trajectory of your career has been as one of our most influential evolutionary biologists. And in the process, um, and not a word I use often, one of our most iconoclastic ones in terms of swimming against the tide and eventually showing that he was absolutely right. So in terms of making people think differently about evolution, I guess my first question for you, David, is, all of us in here, I'm sure, are accustomed to thinking about the great, unwashed, goiterous, first cousin marriage peasants filling the countryside here who reject the possibility that there is such a thing as evolution. And we all know where they're coming from. What I think is much more interesting is in the world of people who are perfectly comfortable with the idea of evolution is nonetheless the incredible tendency to misunderstand it and get it wrong and reach a wrong conclusion about it, which shows, and thus my first question is one that you've spent a lot of time sort of dealing with in your teaching. Why do people get evolution so wrong so much of the time? Well, right. <laughs> that, a smaller question. And there's more than one answer, of course. And I think that, you know, the, um, 
Um, the best answer to a question like that is it has to do with meaning systems and the idea with what are you know, all the ideas in our 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 heads are basically there in order to help us to behave. That's one thing you can say about about um, evolution is whether your meaning system is religious or or non-religious or whether it's left or right politically, whatever it is, um, the way you are and what you do is at least as much due to your symbolic meaning system as your genes, as your genes. And when any idea threatens that, interferes with your symbotype, as we're increasingly beginning to uh, think of it, then that is uh, when you're uh, inclined to reject it. And my, uh, my friend John Haidt, and I just was, did an event with him last week in New York City, just like this one, um, um, I often quote him as saying, if you want to find science denial, in any person, look to what's sacred to that person. Mm -hmm. Look to what's sacred. And so for one person, it might be evolution or climate change. Uh, for another person, it might be sex differences or racial um, uh, differences. If something is sacred to you, it's part of the motor. It's part of your motor that causes you to function. And we don't tinker with that. We don't like other people tinkering with it. And so that's why I think it's always important to know uh, what to relate basically any idea to a person's meaning system and also to respect that system to respect that system is that we really shouldn't be challenging that um, in some respects and that that uh, that governs the way i behave towards religious believers for example i'm not the kind of in-your-face person who says you must believe in um, in evolution okay um given that in sort of your framing your newest book, which is wonderful and great and incredibly interesting, as completing the Darwinian revolution. Um, in what way? Right, so the thesis of the book is that, uh, is that the Darwinian revolution will not be complete until it makes sense of everything associated with the words human, culture, and policy, in addition to the word biology. And for most people, whatever they think of as biology is different than what they think of as human culture and, um, and policy. And we're so far from that. And for me, the most important category of person is not the, is not the religious believer who has difficulty with evolution, not even people who associate evolution with social Darwinism. And there's a whole chapter about social Darwinism. It's the person who thinks that they're perfectly at home with um, evolution, and yet do not actually relate it to what they to what they do. It's an article of faith for them that their ideas, whatever they think, either as professionals or as people, um, is consistent with Darwin's theory. When in fact they don't really know. And when you go to Chuck, and what you find is often massive inconsistencies uh, in um, in uh, what people uh, think and how they behave, including professionally, all of the academic disciplines, sociology, history, you know, um, um, economics for sure, are in fact um, at odds with, with um, uh, modern evolutionary thinking. And so all of these, uh, all of these disciplines need to be uh, updated. Most of all policy, because policy, ev evolution is absent from the entire policy making universe. Evolutionary thinking is absent from the entire policy making universe. And most policy experts are secular in their thinking, they're not creationists, whatever. But the way they think is not tied to modern evolutionary thinking. And that is what the book attempts to do, is to show just how amazingly relevant evolutionary thinking is to uh, just about any policy area that you might think of. Well, in terms of seeing where it begins to intersect policy, and policy in humans instead of Drosophila or something like that. <laughs> the thing you are most famed for is getting people to think differently about groups and the role of groups in evolution. And maybe in terms of just orienting everyone here, take people back to the early 60s when groups and group selection was dominated by the likes of Wynne Edwards. And what was, what was the notion of the role of groups in evolution at the time? Right, so evolution took this, evolutionary theory took this big swing towards individualism in the, uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And so all of a sudden it became about selfish, all about selfish individuals and selfish genes. Everything that evolved 
had to be seen as a form of self-interest. And the most interesting thing to say about that, I think, is that it was part of a larger cultural trend of individualism. It's at the same time that we have, of course, homo economicus in economics, uh, we have methodological individualism in the social <laughs> sciences, we have it, Margaret Thatcher saying there's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. So something happened very broadly culturally that that caused this individualistic swing. Before that, we had people talking more about society as something that existed on its own terms. We had Emile Durkheim talking about basically functionalism. Uh, so social facts that cannot be reduced to, uh, to biological or even psychological facts. So society is an organism. Society is an entity in its own right. It was a common idea and then was eclipsed by individualism and what happened in evolution was part of that larger trend it was like a tail being wagged by some larger cultural dog and now i think again broadly we're coming out of that and we're beginning to think once again and in a much more sophisticated way about the concept of a society as like an organism in its own right the concept of organism is not restricted to the individual organism. A group can be an organism. A small group is especially likely to be an organism. And the whole challenge is, of course, to expand that envelope of being an organism up to the global scale. And until you do that, actually, there will be dysfunctions. That's part of what multi-level selection is, is the idea that uh, if you're going to evolve an organism, you have to select at that scale. Well, let's take people, I don't know, maybe to the mid-70s or so, where the opposite view held sway the most. Multi-level selection was as far from most people's minds as possible. The range of what selection about was pretty much from the individual, dominated by sort of E.R. Wilson and the sociobiological revolution at the time, down to selection at the level of the gene. Richard Dawkins, the notion of the selfish gene is ultimately the unit of selection. And pretty much from that point, you've been out there yelling that that's insufficient and that's too narrow of a view. And you were the one who more than anyone introduced the phrase you just mentioned, multi-level selection. Yes, sometimes selection is forget selfish, a selfish gene, selfish DNA independent of the gene, selfish gene, selfish genomes, but selection at the level of the organism, at the multi-organism as societies as a whole, what has the process been like to get people to think that at different times selection is as far from a single organism, a single gene as possible? Selection is in a very modern sense of at the level of the group. Well, one point I'd like to make is that, that uh, although this is, it was heretical and only a very few people, not just one, but, but uh, only very few people actually stuck up for this idea back uh, back then. At the same time, there was something uh, cordial about it. It did not interfere with my career. I mean, I had good jobs and I got published. Uh, uh, George C. Williams, who was the, the main person who was anti-group selection, was a good personal, um, good personal friend. So isn't it nice that science can be, as it's supposed to be, a process of constructive disagreement? A process of constructive disagreement. Isn't that nice? And yet at the same time, really progress could have been made much, much faster. I mean, the underlying ideas are actually very, very simple. And actually, let me actually, just in a few minutes, I can give you the essence of what this is about. Imagine playing the single game of Monopoly, where the goal is to beat all your partners and to capture all the property. So just imagine playing that game. And then imagine playing a Monopoly tournament where the trophy goes to the team that collectively develops their property the fastest. So imagine playing that game. And I think you can see that just about every decision that you make as a team player in a tournament will be different than playing the single game of Monopoly. And so the message from that is that when natural selection is operating within single groups, then it's like the single game of monopoly. It's selecting for the antisocial behaviors. It's selecting for the behaviors that cause you to succeed compared to other members of your group. 
in order to get a group that functions well as a group, there has to be something like a tournament. There has to be some sense in which groups are competing against other groups. And that's the only way you can get teamwork. Everything we think of as pro-social, altruism, bravery, loyalty, being a solid citizen, all of these things that are good for others and good for one's group as a whole are actually not giving you the advantage within the group. And so there was the problem that Darwin was the first person to see it clearly, that all of the pro-social behaviors, everything that you consider morally virtuous, he could not explain with his theory of natural selection just based on individuals competing with other individuals. He had to invent group selection, the process of tribes competing against other tribes. And of course, all of you can see, he strangely did not comment on it, but that just creates a problem up the scale. Now the groups become selfish. They're, they're internally cooperative, but they're competing against each other. So you have an eliminated conflict. You've just elevated conflict higher up the scale. And that's why if we really want to solve these problems, then we have to take it all the way up the scale. And that this leads very, very strongly to a whole earth ethic. And that's actually the conclusion of my, my book. Some of you probably already have a whole earth ethic, but you now have a um, a uh, scientific authority for saying that, uh, that uh, we really need, well, I really mean that, that it's like the, the one home, the one take home message is science says when we formulate um, our public policies, we have to have the whole earth in mind and then we have to coordinate everything underneath it. It doesn't mean that we have to be sacrificial, but just the benefits can be distributed and need to be distributed all, all up and down the scale. But there's no way we're going to get solve global problems without actually explicitly having the welfare of the earth in mind. That is the only thing that's going to work. And there's a very strong scientific argument, much stronger than ever before. And it opposes the alternative narrative, which is laissez-faire. The narrative that the pursuit of lower level self-interest robustly benefits the common good, as if led by an invisible hand. Okay? That is, we can say, that is wrong. Okay, so in terms of this notion of selection, when it works well at the level of the group, I mean, the basic idea, your basic idea is group selection is a circumstance where an individual with trait A loses out to an individual with trait B. But a group of individuals with trait A defeat a group of individuals with trait B was something that at the individual level is maladaptive, a trait that instead emerges as adaptive at the group level. Just to give what will sound bizarre to people, give them an example of what this looks like with sociopathic chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll give two examples. I think we have time for two examples. One is from nature, and then we'll get to the sociopathic uh, chickens. An example I've been using for, for um, um, decades, but it's evergreen. If you haven't heard it, then, uh, then, uh, but here's an example from nature. Who all knows what a water strider is? Oh, so many of you. There's beautiful, elegant insects which skate on the surface of, of, of a quiet water where they scavenge on, um, on, uh, on prey, insects that have fallen into the water. And it turns out that the males vary greatly in their aggressiveness towards females. At one extreme, the males are psychopathic, sexual predators. They simply hunt females and attempt to forcibly mate with them when they find one. On the other extreme, we have docile males, gentlemen, who wait to be asked to perform their manly duty. So, um, and uh, everything in, in between. And so uh, my graduate student, Omar Eldekar, composed groups of water striders, so six males, six females in each group, and the composition of the males was altered from all psychopaths to all docile males and mixes in between. So what happened? Within every pool that contained both types, the aggressives were more successful mating than the docile. Of course, of course, the bad boys got the girls. <laughs> so in every single pool, aggressive beats docile. But in the pools where all the males were aggressive, they were terrorizing the females. They couldn't eat, therefore they couldn't lay many eggs. And there's a threefold difference in the egg laying fecundity of pools with docile males compared with the, uh, the aggressive males. 
So there you have it. Selfishness beats altruism within groups. Aggressive beats docile within groups. But docile groups beat aggressive groups. Now the final part of the story is he, ma he made up that variation. He composed those groups. But where does the variation come from in nature? And so he did another experiment in which he allowed free movement between the groups. And so now imagine that you're a female and you go into a pool and there's an aggressive male. What are you gonna do? You're gonna leave. <laughs> the male can leave too, anyone can leave, but the whole thing settles down into a kind of an equilibrium with an impressive degree of clustering of the females around the docile males. And so the variation among groups, which is needed, is actually caused by the free movement of the individuals. It's not caused by kin selection, they're not genealogically related, it's caused by partner choice. And here right away we can think about partner choice. Why is it the friendship when we get to choose our partners and we, end, then we, we tend to cooperate with those people more so than if we were just paired with a stranger. And so you can see how this kind of thinking can lead to a theory of friendship and the like. So the chickens um, is uh, chickens live in, I've always lived in groups. Uh, I'm sorry to say they often live in cages now in the poultry industry. And in this experiment, which was to uh, breed for uh, egg productivity, uh, in one experiment, the most productive hen, the egg laying was monitored, and the most productive hen within each cage was selected to breed the next generation. And in a second experiment, the most productive cage was identified, and then all the hens within the, that cage were used to breed the next generation. Well, in the first experiment, after five generations, even though you had selected the most productive hen, egg productivity had gone down, and what you had done was basically the most productive hen was the biggest bully. She intimidated all the others. And what you were really selecting for was aggressiveness, just like my water striders. After five generations, you had a nation of psychopaths, and these hens were murdering each other and plucking each other's feathers. And of course, just like the water striders, they, um, egg productivity was very low. By selecting the most productive cages, that would be group selection, like the Monopoly tournament, then you selected the most cooperative hens, and they had, were nice and docile and fully feathered. So, so here we have uh, water striders, hens, and I do hope that you can see how relevant this might be. I could give you business examples, <laughs> truly. Uh, I love telling the story that when I used the chicken examples long ago, a professor ran up to me afterwards and said, that chicken experiment describes my department. <laughs> I have names for those. <laughs> So just imagine a department that, that promotes its members purely on the basis of their individual productivity. Absolutely. Okay? Not on your teamwork, not any of that, just based on how many pubs do you have, whatever. So what are you going to get? What are you going to get? Genetic evolution didn't take place, but something else did. And so there's another important message, is that just behavioral flexibility, individuals exercising their options, is going to give you something like genetic evolution, like genetic evolution. So that introduces the theme, there's more to evolution than genetic evolution. If I say evolution and you think genes, then we have to go beyond that. Evolution goes beyond genes to all of the fast-paced changes swirling all around us and even within us. Each of us as individuals is an evolving entity. We change. And the way we change is actually could be understood as an evolutionary process using the same toolkit that was developed for the study of genetic evolution. Now, in terms of this, the lessons from water striders or chickens or corporations is incredibly important in the sense of exactly the traits that mainstream theory and evolutionary biology said were going to be the most adaptive and would lead to the most copies of one's genes in the next generation built around individual priorities, individual selfishness, maximizing of individual reproductive success are exactly the traits that are selected against in a group context. And it was in the face of this that a lot of people who were resistant to this idea would sort of say, okay, that's great, but water striders or like chickens where you're artificially grouping them together, this is a circus trick. It is very rare 
to get selection occurring at the level of groups, where suddenly these traits that were once maladaptive are exactly what are selected for. Make the argument, as you've done so successfully, that rarity, though this may be in the natural world, there's no species out there that is more, more prone towards doing this than humans, and humans in small groups. Okay, well, there's a, uh, uh, I want to give two answers to that, to that, um, uh, to that question. Uh, this, this strange swing towards individualism, selfish genes, and then back out again, when you unpack it, what you discover is, is that this, this dynamic that I described, basically selfishness beats altruism within groups, altruistic groups beat selfish groups, this is very general. Uh, this is so general. And why is it general? It's because it's just based on, on the, the very nature of trade-offs, that the, the behaviors that are required to do the best within a group are simply different by virtue of trade-offs than the behaviors that are required to function well um, as a group. And so what that means is, is that every theory of social evolution, no matter what it's labeled, actually has to include this logic. And in retrospect, looking back, if you look at the other theories of, of uh, social evolution that seem to provide an alternative to group selection, such as kin selection, inclusive fitness theory, selfish gene theory, evolutionary game theory, a concept called social selection. All of these were developed as if they were alternatives to uh, group selection, but when you look under their hoods, when you look at them carefully, you see, back, you see that they actually give back with one hand exactly what they took away with the other hand. And so for the cognoscenti in the audience, you know, selfish gene theory, we have replicators, but we have vehicles. And vehicles are giving back with one hand what they took away with the other. In, in, in evolutionary game theory, they call it n-person game theory. What does that mean? Well, it turns out that individuals are interacting in groups of size n. They're giving back with one hand exactly what they took away with the other. In kin selection, you're assuming that these socially acting individuals are genetic relatives. More groups are giving back with one hand what you took away with another. And this didn't really dawn on on people until the 1970s or, or 80s. Uh, W.D. Hamilton, the inventor of inclusive fitness theory, was among the first to see the light. And that's what I think is where you have to kind of turn to become a sociologist of science to ask the question, why wasn't this just understood a long time ago? Why were decades and decades required? And even still, um, you get confusion on this point. And it's there where I think that uh, in just the same way that Darwin was, for all of his insights, he was still a creature of Victorian cultures. There's some things he just couldn't see through. He was a Victorian. Um, you know, he couldn't help but see European culture as superior to other uh, uh, cultures. We can see it, but they couldn't. I think this, uh, this uh, um, individualistic worldview is like that. So many people can't really see beyond it. They must see things in terms of individual self-interest. I've had quite a few conversations with economists, and, uh, and uh, I actually wrote an essay three years ago about Paul Krugman. And Paul Krugman, um, uh, turns out, is an evolution junkie, as he put it. And he was giving a talk to some evolution group, and he wanted to say, oh, I love evolution. I read a lot about it. What I love about evolution is it's a sister discipline to to economics. And then he lists the major things they have in common. And the first thing on the list was individualism. Isn't it great that both are explaining everything in terms of self-interested <laughs> individuals? And, and my essay was saying, yeah, that's how it was back then. But if you want to keep up with evolutionary trends, then this is exactly what we're, what we're, what we're getting away from, is this idea that everything has to be understood as a form of, of individual self-interest. That's the kind of axiomatic uh, uh, stance uh, for which there is no warrant. Well, to give the people a sense of sort of what group selection looks like at the human level, I mean, one of the things that's amazing about David is this is not only the world's expert on water strider, <laughs> sexual, non-consensual <laughs> aggression and personality differences, but at the other end of the spectrum, you've written an incredibly influential book on the evolution of religion, Darwin's Cathedral. 
and analyzing the specific example of the emergence of Calvinism in the Swiss cantons. Why did it succeed when so many others around that time didn't? And this is just a classic example of a group selection level of analysis of what works and what has not succeeded in humans. Well, that thank you again. Yeah, he's, he's asking such great questions. I don't know <laughs> what better person could I ask for to run. Um, and I guess to the second part of your question is the, uh, us being such a cooperative species. And, and uh, let me just kind of uh, uh, um, gather my thoughts here. So basically, I think you have the idea of, of basically these, these warring forces within group selection favoring selfishness, between group selection favoring. Um, uh, pro-socially traits of all sorts. Um, most species are mosaic. These things evolve on a trait-by-trait -trait basis. Um, and yet sometimes uh, this balance between levels of selection is not static, but can itself evolve. And so what happens um, um, on a rare, um, a rare basis is that mechanisms can evolve that suppress the potential for disruptive self-serving behaviors within groups, basically suppress disruptive within group selection so that between group selection becomes the dominant evolutionary force. And then those groups become so cooperative that they become a higher level organism, a super organism. And in biology, this has happened many times. The first time it was documented was, uh, some of you might've heard of Lynn Margulis and her symbiotic cell theory, the idea that nucleated cells did not evolve by small mutational steps from bacterial cells, but as communities of bacteria that became so cooperative that they became the higher level organism, then multicellular organisms, social insect colonies, probably even the origin of life as cooperating molecular uh, reactions. And this is called a major evolutionary transition. And so the big surprise, something we've only dawned upon us during the last 20 or 30 years or so, is that, is that our species is the newest major transition, that in most primate societies is a mosaic of, of cooperative and selfish traits. And you should know uh, with your great studies on, on baboon uh, societies, is yes, there's some cooperation, but also there's intense disruptive selection, status striving, and so on. And, um, and so on uh, and so forth. So also for, for uh, chimp societies. But in the, in our ancestors found ways to suppress disruptive self-serving behaviors. And so they became mostly cooperative at the scale of small groups, at the scale of small groups. And that leads to a very important conclusion that the small group, there's your organism, is a fundamental unit of human social organization that we should be that we should be large-scale society needs to be multicellular it needs to be composed of small groups and then when you look at what happened with the invention of well the whole concept of cultural evolution and the ability to transmit information symbolic thought encoding information in the form of symbolic uh, systems uh, that led to a rapid evolutionary process and then um, and then um, and then with the uh, advent of agriculture, society is becoming larger and larger. And it's now that you get to such things as religion and the arts. So here's another little piece. And I, I feel like I'm speaking fast, but hopefully uh, still, still uh, communicating. Uh, lots of things are just frankly utilitarian. And so explaining them is easy from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, there's other things which are not utilitarian. They don't seem to be utilitarian. And those are puzzles. For us. So why do we believe in the gods? Why do we believe in agents which actually are out there? Uh, we can understand why we walk. Why do we dance? We can understand why we talk. Why do we sing? We can get why we make a bowl. Why do we decorate a bowl? And so most of the arts and religion puzzle us because they don't seem utilitarian. And there's two potential answers to that question. One is, they are in fact not utilitarian. We have to explain them some other way. Or, despite appearances, they are, they are utilitarian after all. And Emile Durkheim started this off by saying that religions, despite appearances, have great secular 
utility. And his famous definition of religion as a community united by a moral, around the sense of the sacred, forms into a moral community called a church. And so if you look at religion and all the arts, and religion is, is really nothing more than a collection of arts activities, is an interesting way to, um, to, um, uh, to think about them. What you find is, is that all of that stuff is immensely useful at the group level. It's basically, it's your, it's your physiology and anatomy of the society is carried through by these mechanisms. And this is so amazing because what it does is it places the arts and the humanities on such an interesting new foundation. I mean, the humanities are so precarious in academia, and this is such a powerful way to, to, to look at them. And I hate to say it, but most uh, um, scholars, people in, in, in universities, in the humanities, really have, have yet to grasp this, basically, and they still have a hostile stance towards science and evolution, and they, they don't really understand what a powerful new foundation this is for, um, for not just studying the, um, uh, the arts and the humanities, but basically making sure that they're strong in all aspects of, of, um, of our lives. Well, in that context, let me, let me shift this to a, a somewhat more personal question for you. Um, I think it really is fair to say that you have spent a lot of time being a voice crying in the wilderness during the long periods where evolutionary thinking was dominated by gene-centric selection models, and, and you've been vindicated. Everybody now accepts multi-level selection as like valid, and in lots of ways, the biggest sort of signal of this was in 2004, having to do with um, E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, Harvard, he's like the most amazing naturalist of the last half century, Every everything he's ever written gets Pulitzer Prizes, he's incredible, <laughs> he's the person who popularized the notion of sociobiology in the 70s, and he was the champion of gene-centered selection as being what evolution was about. And in 2004, you and he published a paper together in Quarterly Review of Biology. And this was, I mean, literally, like I remember people saying, whoa, did you see that David Sloan Wilson and E.O. Wilson published a paper together? Now, for people who were not in the field, this must have just seemed like nepotism or, or kin <laughs> or something. Um, but for people in the know, I, I don't remember what your paper was called. Um, but basically what the title should have been is E.O. Wilson admits he was wrong after all this time. Um, and this was an amazing paper in terms of sa him saying, you know, not in quite as many words, yes, you were right all this time. Did this feel vindicating on some sort of level? Well, actually, the history is a little different than that. It's slightly different. Um, so let me just correct that a little bit. Uh, um, uh, so, my first paper on group selection was when I was a graduate student, and I was working on something else. And then I built a little model about group selection that seemed very general, and, and I could see its significance, even though I was just a pup. And I guess I was a bold pup, because I called Ed Wilson up, <laughs> and I said, i got to talk to you. And so I, um, so, I went to see Ed Wilson, and on my way, I visited George C. Williams, the individual selection guy. And I strode into his office and I said, I'm going to convince you about group selection. <laughs> and he offered me a postdoc on the spot. <laughs> That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. And that initiated our friendship. So then I go to Wilson, and he's such a gracious man. The first thing he does for any visitor, he gives them a tour of his ant laboratory and stuff like that. He's also a very busy man. And, um, and so uh, when time came for me to talk, he sat me in front of a blackboard and he sat down and he said, you have 20 minutes. <laughs> and so I wrote like a madman on the, on the blackboard and he took my manuscript and he had it reviewed and then that article was published in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So back then, he was actually quite sympathetic towards group selection. That's the, what people don't really know. If you read the chapter in, in Sociobiology on group selection, he was actually putting the best face on it that he, that he could. But nevertheless, like everyone else, 
he was tremendously persuaded by W.D. Hamilton and inclusive fitness theory and, and so on and so forth. It was on his own, not due to me, that he basically uh, had, a, I guess, an epiphany about, about uh, a group selection after all. And uh, we were at a conference, the Human Behavior and Evolution Society meeting. Uh, and this is so interesting because this is where evolutionary psychology, basically evolutionary psychology, evolutionary anthropology, these were bold thinkers in the 1980s and the 1990s. Well, they were bold about, about uh, rethinking uh, human behavior, but they were totally doctrinaire about group selection. Hamilton and, and Maynard Smith and Dawkins were their uh, heroes. And, uh, and, and Ed Wilson was giving a plenary. I was there in the audience. And Ed Wilson was laying this group selection on them, and you could hear a pin drop. You could hear a pin drop that Ed Wilson was actually talking about group selection in front of this audience. And Steve Pinker was right in front of me, and he kept looking at Ed and then looking at me and then looking at Ed. <laughs> Steve Pinker is still a holdout. He said that it's, a, I mean, there's still a lot of angst um, out there. So afterwards, in the lobby, uh, I go up to Ed and and we're kind of go off in a little quarter, and Ed said, uh, did you like the grenade that I threw in their midst? <laughs> <laughs> and it was then that I suggested that we co-author a, a, uh, a paper. So there's the real story now, told to the world. Well, I reiterate, the name of that paper should have been E.O. Wilson admits he was wrong, <laughs> and that David was right. One, one last question before turning it over to the audience. Um, not only is this someone who's done research on water striders and the evolution of human religions, but also on personality in sunfish, and also on the molecular genetics of infidelity and promiscuity in humans, and the evolution of humor and laughter and the evolution of gossip, and incredible range of research. And then on top of it, taking your notion that policy should be a branch of evolutionary biology, you've done the most ridiculous thing for an evolutionary biologist I've ever heard of. You went and started a program in the inner city schools of Binghamton to try to apply evolutionary theory, to try to improve educational outcomes there. Does it strike you that you're a little bit of an outlier in terms of your sheer sort of intellectual restlessness and range? Do you, do you have a sense where that came from in you? Well, I don't know. You're making me blush. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, but actually, let me tell you about that school and I, what it represents, because this, I think, brings things quite full circle. We talked about a major evolutionary transition takes place when any mechanism evolves that suppresses the potential for disruptive, self-serving behaviors within groups, then that group becomes a highly cooperative <laughs> unit. So that took place in genetic evolution, as we've said, but do you know it can also take place in real time for all of the groups in our lives, to any group that you're in, any group that you're in, and you could actually design it, if it's not already designed, in order to accomplish what's really a major cultural uh, transition. And here I draw upon the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in 2009. Uh, she studied common pool resource groups, and she showed that they were capable of avoiding the tragedy of the commons. Uh, they did not overexploit their resources, but only if they possessed certain core design principles. And I worked with her to generalize those principles from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And the way to see them is, is accomplishing a major uh, uh, transition. In these groups where these principles are implemented, it's really hard to play the single game of monopoly. That's all there is, that's all there is to it. And so what we did in the school and what we're doing again and again and where we've, we've created a framework for doing, so look us up if you want us to work with your group, please contact us, then is to um, take kids that have flunked three or more of their courses in the eighth and ninth grade, bring them into the school and design those that school so that it includes those core design principles, plus a couple others that are distinctive to education. And do you know there's very same kids did as well as the average high school student on the state exams that everyone took. And it was a randomized control trial, so it was a gold standard of, of assessment. And so there is such potential for basically increasing 
pro-sociality in our groups that basically uh, becomes common sense when you view it through this evolutionary lens, this year of life, as Darwin put it in the final passage of The Original Species. Well, on that note, let's open this to audience questions. Yeah, back there. Okay, I, I'm intrigued. I want to know what the rules are that uh, are going to transform my group into like this cooperative. I'll give them to you. I can do it in less than a minute. Okay. It's worth it. Okay, but first, you have to think of a group that's important in your life, a group that you know well, okay? And then see if these core design principles might work in your groups. Maybe your group already does well, maybe poorly. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking of a high-functioning group. Maybe you're thinking of, of a train wreck. Okay? Okay, so here are the eight core design principles that cause groups to function well. Number one, strong sense of identity and purpose. You have to know that you're a group, who's in it, what it's supposed to do, and that it is important. Number two, proportional costs and benefits. It's not sustainable for some members to do all the work and for other members to get the gain. There must be some sense in which what you give to the group, what you get from the group is proportional to what you uh, give to the group. Number three, inclusive decision making. Fair and inclusive decision making. Not sustainable for some members to be able to make the decisions and for other members not to have input. Doesn't need to be strict consensus necessarily. There has to be some sense in which decision making is open, transparent, and and uh, and uh, fair. Number four, monitoring of agreed upon behaviors. If you don't know if you're behaving as agreed upon, then all bets are off. Number five, graduated sanctions. If somebody's not doing what they should, there has to be some correction, but it need not be mean at the beginning. You don't have to bring the hammer down. Most of us are trying to be solid citizens, <laughs> and if we fail, a friendly reminder is enough. But there are some cases in which you have to escalate. And there must be praise for good behavior in addition to punishment for um, bad behavior. Number six, fast and fair conflict resolution. Conflicts will occur, they have to be resolved quickly, and in a manner disregarded as fair by all parties. Most people in a conflict think that they have a point of view and you should be respecting that when you resolve the conflict. Number seven, authority to self-govern. Unless you have elbow room to govern your own affairs, you can't do all those other things. And number eight, appropriate relations with other groups which embody the same principles. In other words, these principles are scale independent. They are needed for relations among groups in just the same way as the relations within groups all the way up to the interactions among nations. And so when you listen to the European Union and all the problems that we have at a large scale, just try shrinking them down and thinking of them, of them as really much the same as what, 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 what takes place in a small group of, uh, of individuals. There they are. <laughs> dating myself, but in my group of molecular biology graduate students in the 70s, we were so influenced by the selfish gene in Dawkins. I mentioned E.O. Wilson. Did Dawkins come around to this very thing? Because he, his argument seemed so convincing. Right, and so uh, I want to first praise Dawkins before I uh, criticize him. Uh, I think Dawkins did lots of great things. Uh, he turned so many people on to um, evolution remains very articulate. And you can answer your question for yourself. Uh, there's an online discussion between Dawkins and uh, this interesting man named Brett Weinstein, who is the professor that ran into such problems at uh, Evergreen State uh, College, and then has become a kind of a celebrity, uh, uh, and uh, enough so that uh, he had an onstage conversation with Richard Dawkins in Chicago, which is online. And so and he probes him on this. He tries to get Richard Dawkins to say that might religions be adaptive? And he couldn't do it. Dawkins would not, would not go there. And the great, uh, the great mistake that was made back then uh, with selfish gene theory was, of course, selfish gene theory is centered on the concept of replicators. The gene is a replicator. It's the only high fidelity unit. An individual is not a high fidelity 
unit. To find the high fidelity unit, you have to go down to the level of G. Well, that might or might not be true, uh, but either way, it's not an argument against group selection. No one ever said that a group is like a gene. They said a group is like an individual. And if an, if an individual is not a replicator, then a group doesn't have to be a replicator. So this obsessive focus on replicators actually is saying nothing about whether or not a group can be like an individual. For that, you have to turn to the concept of vehicles. And so there we go. Um, uh, and so Dawkins, I believe, you know, you've heard the phrase science pro progresses funeral by funeral. Um, <laughs> that's not true for all of us. But I, I'm, I'm sorry, but it, it appears to be true for Dawkins. Yes. Um, you spoke a little bit about um, evolution. Um, a lot of a lot about evolution. No, no, but the Enlightenment. You know, there's some people who think the Enlightenment was actually the Endarkenment that put science and religion at opposition. And uh, we seem to be, or at least what you have said, we seem to be perhaps coming back around that um, they are explaining uh, the same things only in different language, and that. Uh, religion, uh, it may have some utilitarian purpose, but it may also be real. I mean, all societies have found some uh, sense of that there's something beyond their understanding that's going on, you know, that we may or may not be able to see. I mean, we didn't used to be able to know there was oxygen or nitrogen because we didn't know enough about it. So, uh, what is your... Uh, well, you could people hear that in the back? No. Okay. No, Go ahead. Um, question was, in some ways, the Enlightenment invented the notion that religiosity and a scientific perspective were incompatible. Mm -hmm. And are we in an era where instead people are beginning to see ways where they are compatible? Stephen Jay Gould's term, non-overlapping magisteria, that there's room for both built around the notion that what religiosity may be about is the things that science is never going to explain, if you can paraphrase. Yeah, uh, great questions, and I want to give a number of answers as quickly as I can. So the Enlightenment, of course, uh, set science and reason on the one hand and religion on uh, the other hand. Uh, yeah. The first Enlightenment thinkers actually shared some beliefs with the uh, with Christianity. And of course, you know, people like Isaac, Isaac Newton were devout Christians. Mm -hmm. So that distinction, it's not true that the first Enlightenment thinkers were irreligious. Right. So there's an interesting point to be made there. I think one of the things that the Enlightenment thinkers um, assumed was that there was a natural order, basically, that the world was well ordered mm -hmm. from top to bottom, from the universe all the way down to the tiniest insects. And what made Darwin's theory so disturbing was, was basically the idea that, that order, functional order, what we associate with an, an organism such as an insect or a human implement such as a watch, might exist at a small scale and then cease to exist at a larger scale. Order yields to chaos. That the individual is well ordered, but the society is not. Okay, the individual is well ordered, not the ecosystem. The ecosystem is not automatically an organ, these higher level units are not automatically organisms. That's the whole import of multi-level selection theory. They can be, but they're not necessarily. And so that is something which is distinctive with evolutionary theory. And a comment that I'd like to make about humanism as a tradition, and actually secularist traditions of all sorts, is how much they actually uh, are still centered on the early Enlightenment values and have not taken on evolution. I have an essay titled, uh, Writing Evolution into the, uh, the Fourth Humanist Manifesto. Look at what the Humanist Manifestos, there's three of them, say about evolution. Almost nothing. And so, uh, so there's one point that, that you make. Another point that I, I, I want to make is the distinction for any belief you can evaluate it on the basis of its scientific truth value. Does it actually describe something that's out there? And its practical value, what does it cause you to do? Mm 
okay? And these are not the same. And so we're faced with situations where many meaning systems um, are score high on practical value that cause us to do sustainable things, and yet they're chock full of, of uh, adaptive fictions, falsehoods, okay? And this is true not only for, for uh, religions, but it's true for almost any secular meaning system. What we think about ourselves is not the way we really are. What we think about our, our, our culture is not the way it really is. And so the idea that believing stuff that's not out there because it's useful, that's something which is inherent in almost all uh, uh, meaning systems. A meaning system that really respects the facts is something which is we want to work towards, but it's in the, um, it's in the future. And that the evolutionary worldview is, is basically what I'm trying to do, is to create a worldview which is like a religion, it's strongly motivating and it causes us to do the right thing, and we find it strongly motivating, and yet it respects the facts of the world as much as, as, much as, um, as, much as possible. But then the final thing I want to say is that when it, comes to the, uh, to, when it comes to concepts such as conscious evolution, that we can evolve our own future, and that there can be, we can be part of something larger than ourselves, and that something can become still larger. To Elder Chardin, you might know, it might begin my book with, with the phenomenon of man, and I say that my book is updating the phenomenon of man. This book is updating the phenomenon of man. But the concept of conscious evolution and basically superorganisms, Gaia, has been taboo amongst, uh, in, in, the, in the scientific community. We've been talking about group selection, but try talking about conscious evolution. It's like giving them a wedgie. <laughs> They're just, right, that can't be true. This idea that evolution might have a direction um, is something which is, uh, and so it was really the spiritual thinkers and the religious thinkers that actually um, uh, maintained this idea that evolution can be a conscious process. We can evolve our consciously evolve our futures. We can become something larger than ourselves and make that still larger. Only now has that become something which is scientifically, can be scientifically explained. And, and it's thanks to the spiritual thinkers that kept that alive, basically. So there is a sense in which, um, in which uh, I think uh, there's been a truth that's been kept alive by by religions. But at the same time, religions are chock full along with other meaning systems, and you have to be able to call that out. I mean, you know, the earth is not 6,000 years old. Sorry. That kind of thing. Yeah, they're full of people. Let's see. I, I wanted to ask about something much smaller, but your advertising for the book talks about applying this to cataract surgery, and as someone who's eligible for that, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, that is, um, that gets to, uh, the, where that fits in the book is to think about policy as a branch of biology it seems shocking. And yet, um, uh, another major figure in my book is, uh, is uh, Nico Tinbergen, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973. He was a pioneer of the study of animal behavior, along with Conrad Lorenz and Carl von, von Frisch. And back then, the challenge was to show that behavioral traits can evolve just like any other kind of trait. That the study of behavior is just a branch of biology. A behavioral trait like aggression evolves just like an anatomical trait or a metabolic trait. Well, we know that that's true now. So that was, uh, well, what is policy but a branch of a, a kind of behavior? It's what we want to decide to do. And so the idea that our policies should be based on biology is, uh, is uh, uh, something that I established with three stories. The first story is, has to do with eye development and, uh, and begins with cataract surgeries in, in, uh, in infants. Uh, but just to make a long story short, it's just if you want to... Um, so the story is that when infants are born with cataracts, at first doctors thought that they should wait before they correct it because they didn't want to operate on kids that were too young. But when they did, they discovered that those kids remained profoundly visually impaired. What they didn't understand was that eye development requires 
a continuous input from the environment in order for normal eye development to take place. Knowing that, then they would have a new policy for cataract surgery. But then the, the story goes on to look at myopia. Why are some of us many, so many of us are wearing, wearing glasses? That's because our environment, the modern environment is sufficiently different than our ancestral environment that our eyes are developing uh, um, aberrantly in a modern environment. So this is one example of evolutionary mismatch. When something evolves against, against the background of one environment and then the environment changes, all bets are off. And as to what is, what is the environmental factor that causes our eyes to become misshapen, that um, lots of people think it's like a lot of close work, focusing on close objects. Actually, it's, it might be the amount of time spent outdoors. The amount of time spent outdoors. So that introduces the concept of evolutionary mismatch and the importance of development, basically. The importance of development. So we have other things, such as the hygiene hypothesis, the fact that if we grow up in environments that are too clean, then our immune systems malfunction. And if we raise our children a certain way, and especially if we don't allow enough time for, uh, for um, um, unstructured play, and if we try to accelerate academic learning too early, then that can cause pathologies. And in all of these cases, we think we're doing the right thing. We think we're doing the right thing, but because we don't have the right theory, then we end up basically, um, um, uh, tragically, doing bad things to ourselves and bad things to our children. A bit out of my league here, but um, I was wondering as you were talking, um, are there are there um, cultures within the world that are more um, aligned or more organically um, aligned to the whole group um, mindset that as opposed to well, we know what the United States <laughs> is. I think, but elsewhere in all the world that are much more um, in line with what you're, you're, you're describing. Let's see, for people in the back, question was, when you look, look cross-culturally, are there some cultures that are better fits for your idea of group. when group level selection is optimal mm -hmm. in its outcome? Right, the answer is yes, so there's the short answer. And the person who is, um, uh, there's a number of books that actually uh, uh, get at this uh, um, comparisons of nations. Uh, there's Why Nations Fail uh, by Asimoglu and uh, Robinson. There's The Spirit Level by, uh, by Wilkinson and Pickett. And there is uh, Ultra Society by my colleague Peter Turchin. All of these document basically variation among nations and how well they, they function. And absolutely, we study this um, at, the, um, at the Evolution Institute. Uh, and uh, some of the best functioning nations are the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Francis Fukuyama has a phrase, getting to Denmark. Everyone, all nations want to be like Denmark. They all work so, so well. What is it that causes them to work well? Um, to a large extent, they've managed to scale up those core design principles. Those core design principles that I mentioned, which are important for small groups, equally important for large groups, and, and the nations that function well, uh, more or less, they've managed to, to uh, scale them, um, uh, scale them uh, up. And when you look at the United States, what you find is actually throughout the course of its history, it has varied from the best to the worst. And Peter Turchin has a book called Ages of Discord, which is a very technical analysis of American history, which shows that if you look at the well-being of the average American, then in the 1830s when Tocqueville visited America, historians call that the age of good feelings. And that was the best of times. That was basically a lot of egalitarianism. Then you have the Gilded Age, okay, extreme income inequality. And the average American, their well-being went way now, not just economically, but basically they, uh, um, they didn't grow as tall, they, they, they couldn't get married until later, and they flat out died earlier. And then you had the New Deal. Mm -hmm. That was the second era of good feeling. 
And now we have the second Gilded Age. It's where we're at right, right now. But the well-being of the average citizen of America is an inverse proportion to the amount of inequality. That gets showed very, um, uh, very clearly. So it's pretty clear what we need to do, basically. You don't have to compare America to any other nation. All you have to do is compare America to America at previous times during its history. And yes, we do need something like a New Deal. What, 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 what is meant by, the, by the, the Green New Deal? We don't know. But, uh, but uh, we do need something like the New Deal. We should learn from our own history. And to quote Wilkinson in that context, um, if you want to live the American dream, move to Denmark. Let's <laughs> 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 see. Great rules for a, for a good functioning group.